Great. Thank you so much. No uh, hello. Yeah, to our all audience, hello and a warm welcome to the fifth lecture of Middle East 101 series. Uh, my name is Asif Shuja and I will be the host for today's session. The title of today's lecture is Russia's engagement with the Middle East and why it matters for Asia. And at present this lecture, we have with us our guest, Dr. Lee Chen Sim. Dr. Lee Chen Sim is an assistant professor at Khalifa University in the UAE. She holds a PhD in politics from Oxford and is a specialist in political economy of Gulf and Russian energy and its intersection with domestic politics as well as international relations. Her interests include the politics of energy in the Gulf, Gulf Asia exchanges, and Russia Gulf interactions. Her latest book is Low Carbon Energy in MENA, which was published by the Palgrave last year. Dr. Lee Chen will speak for about 40 minutes, after which we shall open the floor for questions. Our audience may send their questions through the chat function to MEI event, who will forward them to me. Uh, with this brief introduction, I request our today's speaker, Dr. Lee Chen, to take the floor. Dr. Lee Chen, please, floor is yours. Thank you for the very generous introduction, Asif, um, and thanks for the invitation um, to speak at your wonderful event. Um, before I start, I'm just going to uh, attempt to share my screen uh, so that you can see uh, some of the slides. Okay, so I'm hoping that you are going, that you are actually seeing the screen. Um, uh, Asif, can you see the screen? Okay, great. So um, since you can see the screen, that's fantastic. Um, I, I can start now. So um, I've been asked to talk about Russia's engagement in the Middle East, um, uh, you know, how it does this engagement, why it does what it does, um, what are some of its results, and why this is important to Asia, why, why uh, Russia's engagement is important to Asia. So uh, without further ado, I will begin. Um, first question I always get asked is, what does Russia want in the Middle East? And um, it, it, it does want a few things, but I'm going to here focus on three things that I think it wants most in the Middle East. Uh, first of all, it's a recognition of its great power status. Now, um, Russia was very involved in the Middle East um, before the 1990s as part of the Soviet Union. It was a very active power uh, in the Middle East. Uh, since then, um, up to about 2000 and maybe the, the early 2000s, its presence was kind of whittled down because Russia was, you know, uh, focusing on its inward uh, rebuilding and it was focusing on ties on the US and on Europe, which has always been its primary or its core foreign policy concern. So its relations with the Middle East was kind of left adrift for a very long time. Uh, but since the first decade of the uh, 21st century, it has come back in a big way. And for Russia, it wants the recognition that it is a great power, not just that it is a great power, but the recognition from other states in the Middle East and North Africa that Russia is a great power. Um, historically, uh, traditionally, Russia has always seen itself to be deserving of great power, and we call that its will to power. And so this is something it wants, not just as a, to be seen as a regional power in Europe, um, but also as a global power, which is able to extend its influence in the Middle East, um, as well as Asia. So that's the first thing that it wants. Um, I would say that the second thing which Russia wants in the Middle East is kind of like a um, you know, tactical uh, commercial opportunities where it can uh, find niche in say its exports um, and in commercial tie-ups, uh, it will look for this um, because you know it, it finds that uh, the region has got lots of opportunities for its products, uh, whether it's food, uh, whether it's weapons, uh, whether it's um, joint ventures in say oil and gas. Um, there are commercial opportunities available in the Middle East. And um, because the Middle East seems to be quite open to these ventures, uh, Russia gets, uh, is quite interested in expanding its ties with the region. 
Uh, finally, in the Middle East, um, I believe that what Russia wants is also stability, right? Not so much stability in the Middle East, but sort of stability in the Middle East so that there is stability in its own backyard, right? So not stability for stability's sake in the Middle East, but stability in its backyard. So if you look at this map of Russia, I think it's quite interesting because um, Russia's soft spot in terms of security has always been um, the Central Asian region. So the region to the south of Russia, um, where you see uh, Kazakhstan um, stretching all the way down to the Gulf countries. And that's kind of always been called the soft underbelly for Russia in terms of ev invasion routes um, and all that in history. So as long as there's some form of stability in the Middle East, uh, stability as defined by Russia, then um, it will not spread to, uh, let's say, uh, Afghanistan or Pakistan, which will then has a risk of spreading to the more Muslim areas in Central Asia, and of course, in the South of Russia, which may then affect Russia itself. Now, why is this a soft underbelly? Um, because this is a traditional invasion route. And for Russia, its focus is definitely on Europe to the left-hand side of Russia in this map. And so instead of fighting or, or, or planning for two, two frontal defense, um, it would prefer to concentrate its attention and forces in um, on the West, on Europe. And so it would like some peace in South Russia in its traditional underbelly. Now that we kind of know what Russia wants in the Middle East, let's have a look and see how Russia actually gets what it wants or how it attempts to get what it wants. So what are some of the tools that Russia uses to try to get what it wants? Um, I will suggest a few tools and I start here with political tools, it's political approaches. Uh, so Russia relies on not just bilateral partnerships, but as well as um, multilateral fora. So if you see here, um, Russia has a series of uh, formalized bilateral partnerships in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, but of course, this is not the only bilateral partnerships it has. Clearly missing from this is, for example, its uh, close relations with Morocco and Syria, uh, which have not been formalized you know, in the form of a uh, document, uh, unlike these four countries that you see on screen. Um, apart from bilateral partnerships, it is so very heavily engaged in multilateral fora, um, whether it's with the um, uh, African countries or whether it's with the Gulf countries, um, which are the pictures you see there. And so in this way, it, it, it engages both bilaterally and multilaterally and actually shows up and is a presence in these forums. Now, um, I also mentioned as well, special envoys. And that's something that uh, Russia has developed maybe in the past about 10 years. It's appointed special envoys to the Middle East, uh, to Syria, to reconstruction in Syria, to the Middle East peace process. And so these special envoys from Russia have been reaching out um, diplomatically um, to uh, show up and to uh, engage uh, the various parties uh, in the process. Um, you may think that this is just you know, diplomacy, it, it's, it's not really concrete, uh, but I can assure you that for um, many, many Middle Eastern states who sometimes feel ignored, um, particularly by the US, uh, having special envoys, Russian special envoys, or multilateral or bilateral relationships, um, it does make a difference. Um, another approach that Russia uses is in the economic aspect. And here we find, uh, I'll, I'll just highlight three of them. Uh, the first one is in terms of trade <clears throat> and uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, in this area, Russia does reach out to these countries in the Middle East and North Africa. But as you can see from the chart there, Russia is not really a top import and export partner for many of the, these Middle East and North African states. Um, it is, it does you know, play a role, but it is not a key, let's say top 10 uh, trade partner with many of these countries. Um, part of the reason is that for the Gulf countries, 
uh, you know, just like the saying, you can't bring coal to Newcastle. Um, the Gulf and Russia have quite similar energy-based uh, economies. And so it's not that easy um, to be each other's top trade partners. Um, so in terms of trade, it, it, it is increasing its trade numbers, its trade ties, its trade volume, um, but it's nothing on the scale of China or the uh, US or many European countries, which continue to be the top trade partners of many MENA countries. It's the same story in terms of FDI. Um, Russia is not a huge financial power, and hence there's not a lot of Russian FDI in the Middle East. Of course, um, it does exist. Um, for example, Russia has a gas concession in the UAE. Um, Russia does have, um, say, uh, plants, manufacturing plants in Saudi, uh, let's say, building arms. Um, but it's, it's um, nothing uh, compared to, say, uh, the other traditional powers, the Europeans, uh, the Japanese, the Chinese, um, and um, the, um, yeah, okay. Um, so moving out from the trade and FDI, the other, I think one of the most important uh, tools that Russia has in its economic toolkit is its platform in OPEC+. Plus. So many of you will be aware that Russia and Saudi Arabia are joint uh, uh, chairs of OPEC+, Plus, which is a grouping of oil uh, producing and exporting countries. Uh, it used to be just OPEC, uh, mostly the Middle East and uh, countries, but it's been expanded to include even the non-OPEC members uh, led by Russia. So this is a very important platform for Russia to get its voice heard in the Middle East. And as a key energy exporter, as a key oil exporter, uh, this lends it a lot of gravitas when it comes to relations. It's got a co-equal role uh, in this process in setting uh, oil volumes and oil prices. But it's not just in oil. Um, Russia is also one of the leaders in the Gas Exporting Countries Forum. It's not as uh, active as OPEC, but it still um, you know, uh, uh, allows it to uh, speak with some of these important gas exporters in the Middle East and elsewhere. Um, uh, Russia, of course, exports a lot of oil to um, many of these amina countries, um, particularly, for example, uh, you have them exporting oil to Turkey. Uh, it's one of the top oil exporters as well as gas exporters to Turkey. Uh, speaking about Turkey, Russia is also very active there in another form of energy, which is nuclear. Uh, Russia is helping uh, Turkey and Egypt built nuclear uh, reactors in order to produce nuclear electricity. Um, so it also has its influence there. Uh, Russia is also uh, one of the contenders to build a nuclear power uh, station in Saudi Arabia. Uh, moving out from energy in terms of food, uh, Russia is also a big supplier of, of food, uh, mostly grains. Uh, cereals, wheat, that kind of thing, uh, to the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, you can see those charts there with the figures. Uh, it, it really plays um, a huge role in the um, uh, grain supply to these countries. This was even before the war in Ukraine, uh, you know, picked up uh, uh, Russia as a key food producer. Uh, Russia was already increasing its food uh, exports uh, to that region already after the first decade of the 21st century. Um, let's move on and look at some of the security approaches. Uh, what kind of tools does Russia have in terms of um, security? And here I will just mention um, two tools. Uh, one of them is basis. So because Russia is keen on some sort of um, presence to uh, underline its great power status, and also to have some kind of forward operation base from which to um, ensure its regional presence, it, it is looking for bases in the Middle East um, and North Africa. And so far, it has secured um, bases in Syria. Syria is a traditional uh, Soviet ally uh, during the, the Soviet times. And hence, um, it, it's had bases there for a while. And it's, um, recent, and it's uh, recently uh, signed uh, extended leases on these um, naval bases and air bases in Syria. 
As well, um, looking further afield, uh, apparently Russia has been offered or is interested in military bases in Yemen. It's um, been discussing with Sudan about um, a naval base as well. And indeed, uh, Russia actually approved um, a naval base in Sudan, but with the you know, uh, political uh, upheavals in Sudan, that's now been put into a bit of a question uh, whether it's actually going to be able to acquire a um, naval base in Sudan. So basis is something that um, it, it is looking for and it would like to have, although of course some people are saying that it, it might be a financial burden for Russia to actually um, uh, operate these bases. Um, another tool, Toolkit, another tool in its toolbox in terms of security would be arms sales. Um, sales is not just a commercial thing that um, Russia does. Uh, it also brings it um, political benefits. It brings it diplomatic benefits. It is more of a strategic benefit as well. And here you can see that uh, uh, Russia's share, uh, the Middle East share of uh, Russian arms sales has actually doubled uh, in, in the past decade. Uh, from 11% to 20% um, share today of its total arms sales. Um, Russia is, of course, the second largest arms exporter in the world, um, bested by the US, which, of course, exports um, a lot of its arms to the Middle East. The key point to note here is that um, uh, the Russians have made inroads uh, into the arms market of, of uh, countries that were formerly clients of the US. They still, these Middle Eastern states, uh, Egypt, for example, still continue to buy arms from the US, um, but uh, Russia has made very good inroads uh, into the Egyptian market. It's made good inroads into the Iraqi market, for example, um, and um, it's, it's giving um, the US a run for its money in Turkey. So um, the, the point here being that uh, Russia has gained inroads into um, former American or European uh, clients. Um, so Russia is particularly uh, active in its uh, small arms market, which is like rifles, Kalishnikovs. And here, uh, Russia has set up a Kalishnikov production factory in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Russia is, of course, also very uh, well-versed in selling its um, anti-aircraft uh, anti systems, uh, whether it's to Turkey or to Syria. Um, moving away from the security realm for a while, um, let's look at some of Russia's um, public diplomacy approaches. How does it do sort of like people to pe more of a people to people kind of um, approach in the Middle East? Because as you will see, that's also quite an important tool which Russia uses to enhance its influence here in the Middle East. Let me give you um, some aspects of that. Let's look at education. Now, if you look at education, um, there, there are Russian language schools in the Middle East. And here on the, on the left-hand uh, side, uh, you will see uh, Russian language uh, being taught in public schools in Syria. Um, with Russia's influence in Syria, um, you know, in, English is one of the languages they are taught, but then uh, Russia has uh, recently or rather in the past decade maybe been introduced uh, as one of the language they are taught in public schools. So not a private school, but this is actually a public schools in Syria. Um, you will also find Russian schools uh, in the UAE. Um, there are actually two schools there. So um, you have a Russian school, not, not just a language school, but this is a Russian curriculum school uh, in Dubai, which has been there since the 90s. And this year, um, a Russian school actually opened in Abu Dhabi, just opened up this year. So again, I think that speaks to its influence in education because um, Russia's science and math education in particular uh, has won uh, you know, a lot of recognition uh, for its strengths in those areas. Outside of education, if you look at promotion of Russian say, culture and technology, Russia has a institution much like the uh, Confucius Institute or like the British Council. Uh, it's called Russo Trudy Festival, and they operate a lot of these centers um, in the Middle East, as you can see there. So it's also very active in promoting um, Russian culture, Russian technology, etc. 
Then when it comes to media, um, Russia's um, Arabic language media is also very active in the Middle East and North Africa. So yes, we have BBC Arabia, we have CNN Arabia, but it is the Russian Arabic language media, particularly its social media, um, RT, you have, um, RT Arabia, you have Sputnik. Um, these uh, reach a very large number of audiences across the Middle East and North Africa. And the table on top there uh, will show you that uh, RT, which is the Russian um, uh, Arabic language media, one of them, uh, is actually it does quite well compared to Al Arabiya, run out of Saudi Arabia, or um, uh, the other stations. Uh, so it's commonly cited as one of the top five um, uh, media that is referenced uh, among Arabic speakers in the region. So that allows Russia um, a platform to put its views forth. And um, according to some um, analysts, um, it's particularly, uh, uh, you know, it reaches to the Arabic audience because it tends to be very, um, you know, it's, it's short and sweet kind of a broadcast. Um, and it really plays up um, Russia's uh, perception of its strengths in the Middle East. Uh, it also tends to denigrate um, particularly the West. So it engages in kind of a black PR of let's say the American position. And so um, it tends to get quite a lot of airplay in the region um, because many of these countries are also unhappy um, with the American um, presence in the region. So it really gets quite a lot of airplay and sympathetic ear in the region. Um, its public diplomacy approach, Russia's public diplomacy approach is also encapsulated in its role of Islam, right? Um, for, for Russia, um, it has seen its, um, its Islamic population as a strength in terms of how it helps in outreach to the wider Middle East. So there you have a picture of the uh, Chechen president, uh, Chechnya being one of the uh, republics in Russia. Um, he is a very popular figure here in the Middle East and in the Gulf. He's a very frequent visitor. And so his relations um, with the Gulf states have really helped also by extension to enhance uh, Russia's image. Um, and rehabilitate, rehabilitated Russia's image in the Muslim world um, ever since its um, invasion of um, Chechnya in the 1990s. In the middle picture there, you have the um, Mufti of Syria um, talking to um, ch a Chechen delegation, and the Chechens have been active in sending delegations to fight in the Syrian war. Again, you know, giving credence to the fact that this is, um, you know, uh, it can be seen as an Islamic war, jihad, and so that um, the other Muslim countries should support uh, Russia's uh, interests in Syria. Um, moving out of the of that realm, we see that in terms of new frontiers in public diplomacy, namely space, uh, Russia is also very active. Um, Russia has sent something like at least 14 um, satellites from Saudi Arabia into space. It's launched vehicles uh, above the Soyuz capsule or in from its launch pad in Kazakhstan have helped to launch these satellites. And uh, Russia was also, of course, instrumental in helping the UAE send its first um, astronaut into space. Um, if we look at another area of public diplomacy, um, which is a new area, which is vaccine diplomacy, um, Russia's Sputnik vaccines have also been used uh, quite widely in the Middle East and North Africa, as you can see from that list. Um, so it's not just the Chinese vaccines or the um, American ones or the European ones which are being used, but Russia is also, uh, Russia's vaccines um, have also been quite widely accepted there. Um, there have been some problems uh, in terms of, um, you know, delivery schedules, uh, production of these vaccines, uh, but, um, uh, uh, you know, generally it is um, quite widely uh, accepted in the Middle East. So then we come to the question, right? So now that we know what Russia wants, uh, we know how Russia tries to get what it wants in the Middle East, um, what have been some of the results? Has Russia been successful in meeting um, some of its goals? 
Um, I would argue that um, economically, Russia has definitely increased um, its economic engagement with the Middle East. And hence, we see, you know, you can easily find a lot of figures that show you trade improvements, uh, a rise in trade between um, Russia and the Middle East. So in terms of economic outcomes, I think that has been quite opportunistic, but quite successful as well. Um, if we look at, um, uh, in terms of its diplomatic heft, has Russia um, been recognized as a great power in the Middle East? Has it been accepted as a great power in the Middle East? Um, here again, I, I would say yes. I think um, Russia, the, the phrase we use is Russia has returned to the Middle East. So you see that Russia is friends with um, many of the opposing parties in the Middle East conflict. Um, it's on good terms with um, the um, Sunni Arabs, it's on good terms with the Shia, it's on good terms with Shia in Iran, it's in good terms with Israel, you know, uh, um, um, the sworn enemy of, of Iran, for example. Um, it's on good terms with all these parties who have conflicts with one another. Uh, within Palestine, it's got you know, on good terms with Hamas, it's on good terms with Fatah. Uh, in Syria, it's on good terms with all the parties in the conflict, be they uh, you know, Syria, Iran, Turkey. Um, so you know, it, it, it really has increased its diplomatic heft to the extent that it really has no enemies in the Middle East. Uh, some claim it has no permanent friends. Um, but then by that same token, it's also quite useful that it's got no really permanent enemies either. So it inserts itself in a lot of the, uh, you know, the uh, deconflicting process, uh, in, whether it's in Syria through the Astana process, um, it inserts itself in a lot of the uh, attempts to, let's say, rebuild Syria or Libya for that matter. Um, so I think diplomatically and politically, um, Russia has really, uh, uh, you know, uh, reinforced uh, its heft in the Middle East. What does the public think, uh, the, the public in the Middle East think of Russia? Has it been very successful in um, rebuilding Russia's image in the Middle East? And I think here, again, the answer is yes. Russia has been quite successful in that. Um, if you look at the top table, it will show you how Arab youths um, think about who their top allies are, who, who are the strongest allies uh, from the point of view of um, uh, Arab youths aged about 18 to 24. And whereas Russia was not in the picture, um, uh, previously, since 2017, uh, Russia has been uh, within the top five strongest allies, uh, even considering that this poll looks at, um, you know, countries within the region, right? So um, Russia has really made great inroads into um, the uh, perceptions of um, Arab youth. And lately, it has, it has even displaced um, the U.S., uh, according to this poll, uh, as one of the strongest allies uh, for the Arab world. Then if you look at the uh, another indicator of what Russia's uh, influence is like uh, or, or how Russia is perceived in the Middle East, um, there was this recent poll, uh, the Arab Youth Survey, um, in, in which they looked at uh, Arabs from across the region. And the question there, as you can see, posed, um, you know, who is uh, more responsible for, who is responsible for the war in Ukraine? And yes, uh, the, the big circle there would show that most people, most Arab youths would blame uh, the US and NATO allies at 31%. But I think equally interesting is if you look at the breakdown between the Gulf states, North Africa and the Levon countries, um, it's quite interesting to me at least um, that um, Russia, you know, who, uh, the region that blames Russia more than the others um, is actually um, the Gulf states, uh, although that's still uh, you know, at 22 percent. And then uh, the rest of the uh, region, the North Africans and the Levant, um, blame Russia far less. So the point being here that, you know, it's also useful to see um, Russia's influence across the Middle East, not just as a bloc. Russia in MENA, right? Uh, Russia's influence does vary uh, according to whether it's in the Gulf, North Africa, 
or in the Levant. And I think that's something that, you know, um, uh, it is not often uh, uh, remarked in some of these um, uh, seminars or webinars about Russia. It's not a unified policy towards the Middle East and North Africa. Um, there is some uh, nuances. Uh, Sorry, then I guess the question is, why has Russia been successful, right? Um, why have um, the Gulf states or the North Africans or the Levant been quite welcoming of Russia's presence? And I think partly it's because, um, uh, you know, they value uh, these uh, Middle Eastern North African states, um, value Russia's, uh, obviously, its diplomatic um, uh, convening power that it can get them together and discuss things. Um, uh, Russia has put forth plans, for example, for a Middle East security, a collective security forum, uh, just like the Americans have, uh, just like the Iranians have. So Russia has shown some initiative. Uh, Russia has also been very careful to uh, uh, listen to some of the aspirations of the region. So, for example, the region uh, is quite interested in localizing production, not just in importing stuff from overseas, but localizing production so that there is there are jobs in the Middle East. So Russia is, you know, has said, okay, great, uh, you can put an arms factory here in the Middle East. Okay, great, um, we will build um, some aircraft parts, you know, in the Middle East. Um, so it's quite keen on supporting um, local initiatives. And I think um, that's quite appreciated by the Gulf states who are looking to diversify relations, both economically and in terms of um, foreign policy. Um, then, of course, um, uh, the other reason is that Russia is a big um, uh, energy supplier to some of these uh, Middle Eastern states. And I mentioned Turkey, of course, there's Egypt. Um, so, so it's also appreciated, you know, that, that, that there's some kind of um, diversification. Uh, you don't just get it from the uh, North American or the European sources. So um, finally, I, I thought I'd invite you to consider a little bit um, what is Russia's influence in the Middle East? What is its influence and, and what is the impact on Asia? for the current, uh, as, as a result of the current conflict that Russia is having with Ukraine. Um, you know, uh, should Asia be interested in what's going on? How does Russia's influence in the Middle East get impacted by the war in Ukraine? And how does that influence um, uh, its significance for Asia? And here I would suggest four areas in which we can think of an answer to this question. Um, the first being um, Russia's uh, relations with its OPEC plus partners, um, most of which are in the Middle East. And the idea is this, um, as long as Russia is a part of OPEC plus, um, it will have some kind of control over oil supply and hence oil prices. And in turn, this means that um, energy poor Asia for the most part, um, you know, uh, Russia is still a very important factor in um, energy prices in Asia. And that is largely thanks to its role in OPEC+. Plus. So I guess, you know, the question would be, are you sure Russia is still going to be part of OPEC+, Plus, um, even though, you know, some of these um, European sanctions could damage the Russian industry? And I, my answer to that would be yes, I think the, the Middle Eastern states, the Gulf states, will continue to be very interested in having Russia as a part of OPEC+, Plus, because even with the sanctions, even with some of the destruction in the Russian oil production, um, Russia will still be the world's second largest um, oil exporter. Um, uh, let's say it's, if its oil production is destroyed by 3 million barrels a day, that's still about 7 million barrels uh, um, of uh, uh, oil a day that Russia will produce. And by far that makes it the second, that will make it the second largest producer in OPEC plus because nobody else comes close to that. Um, the next closest is probably, um, you know, the UAE and uh, Iraq at around maybe about 4 million barrels. Um, so Russia will still have a lot of influence in OPEC plus and hence over oil prices all over the world, including in Asia. Um, how about um, Russia's significance on ex uh, Islamic extremism? 
Well, even here, I think what happens in the Middle East is, is going to be quite important for Islamic extremism in a sense of will Russia withdraw from the Middle East because of its problems in, in Ukraine, in Europe? Uh, for example, um, are Russian forces in Syria going to be withdrawn? Is Russia going to pay less attention to what's happening in Yemen or what's happening to Libya, where it has quite a key role? And if it does withdraw or it does pay less attention to the Middle East, then will the fires you know, of ex Islamic extremism um, be reignited or be worsened? And uh, the answer to this question will have quite a bit of impact on Asia um, because of um, is, uh, some of these ex Islamic extremist movements as transnational movements, uh, which as we in Singapore know, um, can have an, an impact in Asia uh, in terms of radicalizing um, Islamic groups um, like the JI. Um, a third area I would invite you to think about a response to this question is that will how will how will this impact Russia's position in Asia? Um, and I think because uh, it's going to impact in two ways, either um, Russia is going to cooperate more with China uh, uh, because it's you know kind of chased out of Europe a bit in, in terms of energy. Uh, Europe will be more uh, Russia will cooperate more with China. And actually, be a sense, in a sense, a kind of a force multiplier when it comes to China-Russia relations, because it adds to China's heft. So, uh, its its energy supplies add, add to China's heft. Um, China's drone uh, industry um, augments uh, Russia's uh, conventional weapons uh, industry, and hence, together, they are seen as a force multiplier in Asia or even in the Middle East. So. In that sense, um, where Russia goes is also depends, of course, on, on how the war in Ukraine turns out, right? Um, it, it can, it probably could cooperate more with Russia, uh, with China. But in a sense, I also think that there is a potential for more competition um, with China, right? Um, in terms of, of even competition with the Gulf states, because um, they all like China and India as a market for energy. And hence, um, if Russia is chased out of Europe for energy reasons, um, Russia will compete more with its Middle Eastern uh, uh, friends in terms of uh, accessing and increasing market share in Asia, uh, in China, India, um, Pakistan, uh, etc. Then finally, I would also invite you to think about what is Russia's influence on the low carbon energy transition in Asia? Um, Russia is not just an oil and gas giant, it is also a coal giant. Uh, for countries like Japan and South Korea, they import a lot of coal. Um, Bangladesh, uh, you know, uh, it is, uh, it's, uh, Russia is building nuclear power stations in Bangladesh. Um, how is uh, Russia's situation in Ukraine going to impact uh, the low carbon energy transition in Asia? Is it going to, to increase uh, Asia's turn to low carbon energy or because Russia is going to be more interested in selling coal to Asia, it's just going to um, throw a spanner into the works when it comes to um, defossilizing uh, Asia's energy needs. So um, with that, I will stop here and very happy um, to take questions um, on, on this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Li Chen, uh, that was really very informative and particularly on a topic that is of so much of interest in the current days. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, many of us, uh, in fact, the whole world, most of the world had written off Russia, you know, and now Russia has, uh, we, we see Russia back with a bank. So uh, when we talk about uh, Russia and you know the complex uh, the complexity of the problem uh, whenever the problems appear very complex particularly related to the states uh, I think it's a good idea to take a humanistic approach because uh, the states are eventually run by people uh, so the ideas and uh, aspirations uh, and the tools and techniques that are related to a person that is actually enhanced in the form of the state uh, that is uh, uh, particularly, uh, you know, 
uh, linked to the, the aspects of Russia in the current days and the leadership of Mr. Putin. So my first question to you would be, uh, how much of whatever you have said in terms of aspirations, in terms of approaches, in terms of the thinking uh, related to Russia is uh, 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 eventually reduced to the personality of Mr. Putin. How much of these aspirations are uh, particularly uh, invested in the personality of Mr. Putin and how much of it is the aggregate national interest and aspiration? I think that may help us understand Russia more. Thank you. Excellent. So that's a very ex that's a very very good question, because then it 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 tries to answer the question: What happens post Putin? Right? Uh, is that going to continue the same kind of policy? And and uh, my answer to that would be to, um, uh, you know, sort of like reemphasize what I mentioned about one dimension of Russian. Uh, uh, interests, which is to be seen as a great power, right? This idea that Russia deserves to be a great power, it was born to be a great power, it, it, it's, its territory spans Asia and Europe, right? And so it, it deserves that kind of role. Uh, it's got huge, tremendous resources, natural resources. And hence, um, I think that aspiration of Russia as a great power, it transcends Putin. Right. It's something which um, the intellectuals in Russia across different political stripes uh, and, uh, you know, the people in Russia, I, I think they will all agree um, about that point. So um, where um, President Putin comes in is in operationalizing and realizing and that kind of great powerness. So he has managed to, you know, operationalize and implement some of those great power aspirations in the Middle East. Um, so, so where his success is, is in actually, you know, meeting some of these aspirations, but these aspirations, I think, uh, transcend, um, uh, transcend uh, Putin himself. So uh, what you are actually saying is that the yesterday's news that has come up about the mobilization of military, uh, which is like uh, a large number of uh, Russian soldiers are uh, seeing the death. So uh, will this be a testing time for the leadership of Putin as far as the entire period of Russia-Ukraine crisis is concerned? Would this really be an epoch moment for Russia's involvement in the Ukraine? Um, not sure whether it will be a, uh, an epochal moment because there there, were, there are many you know uh, key moments in this conflict. Um, you know how Ukraine uh, defends uh, its its territories or tries to take back some of these lost territories is also quite an epochal moment. Um, but certainly having this um, mobilization, partial mobilization, is a huge milestone um, for 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 Putin's regime. Um, but of course, this is just a partial mobilization. It's not quite yet a full mobilization. And because it was kind of known in advance, um, those who can flee Russia to escape, um, you know, the partial mobilization are escaping, are fleeing. I mean, um, there are so many reports of flights out of Russia, just, you know, booked solid. You cannot get a flight out of Russia because it's all booked. So, so there are people fleeing Russia, but, uh, you know, you have to realize even before the mobilization call, people were already leaving Russia, those who can, especially those who have resources. Um, we saw many of them, we see many of them in Dubai, for instance, much more than usual. Um, they're not just tourists, but they're also people here who have rushed, uh, enrolled their kids in schools. Um, they've been renting homes. So we, so we do see um, that kind of uh, flows uh, even before um, the partial mobilization call. Um, but yes, I think his uh, resort to partial mobilization uh, is a, uh, it's a very key moment. It means that there are quite severe losses and that their attempts to mobilize or to recruit, uh, you know, prisoners, Russian prisoners to fight in the war, to recruit mercenaries uh, is, is not going uh, as, as well as they planned. They don't have the numbers. Uh, thank you so much. With your grip uh, on all aspects of Russian diplomacy, I think there's so much to learn from you, especially uh, in the context of whatever is going on. And I'm sure our audience will also have a lot of questions or comments to uh, share with us and to ask to you. And I would invite the audience to please send in their questions through the chat function of Zoom uh, to MEI event, uh, who would then forward them to me. And uh, in the meantime, as the questions are coming, I have many of them. And I think the most important before I ask their questions is, 
Uh, where did we go wrong in terms of assessing Russia as a big power? Did we make mistake? Because in future, it has implication on a uh, future in our understanding of uh, great power dynamics, the geopolitics of, of not just Middle East, but the whole world. Where did we go wrong? Or did we go wrong at all? What do you think about it? Okay, so, so let's look at the Middle East, where there has been a question of who lost the Middle East, right? The, the Americans like to ask this question, who lost the Middle East? Um, because the Middle East has traditionally been, you know, an, well, a British first and then an American um, area, right? The America is sort of the uh, guarantor of stability in the Middle East. So um, since 2014, there has been this angst-filled question, right? Um, who lost the Middle East, right, for, for the US? Um, and I think that uh, the answer to this question is not so straightforward because it's not just that you know America has been less engaged. You know that there is a perception um, of American withdrawal. There is definitely uh, Middle East fatigue in the U.S. So yes, partly there has been the fatigue, but I think partly we have to give credit to Russia's um, you know outreach to the region, uh, not just in terms of militarily in Syria. Um, but, you know, it has uh, really engaged the region in terms of its um, uh, partnerships. It has engaged the region in terms of more concrete things like food, like energy. Um, so it, it has shown up in the region. It has shown that um, Russia matters in terms of these aspects. It has also been very, I mean, it's super active in media. Um, you know, you won't believe uh, how often uh, Russian uh, uh, media viewpoints are then repeated in some of these um, Arabic language uh, Twitter feeds, for example. So um, Russia's, uh, it, you can't just say that America lost the Middle East, but I think uh, Russia has really made a great strides to insert itself into the region, whether um, militarily, economic, uh, economically, or in, in other fields. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have some questions, especially on energy. Before that, uh, just one question linked to what we have just been uh, discussing, because what you have said uh, about the views of the Middle Eastern on this Russia-Ukraine war, they see it more as a fault of uh, US NATO, NATO expansion, you know? So can you uh, throw some more light on that? Because I think it's very important to understand Russia's relationship with the Middle East. Okay, sure. Um, so, um, uh, yes, yeah, so it, it, according to those, the poll, uh, most of them blame um, the US and NATO for the war in uh, uh, Ukraine because um, the, the, the uh, re reasoning is that uh, US moves, uh, NATO's moves, uh, sort of like a panicked Russia or, you know, made Russia view threatened uh, its expansion uh, to, of NATO to, to Eastern Europe, um, you know, made Russia wanted to defend itself. Uh, and hence, uh, it, it then started the war in Ukraine. So um, many will see that this is the fault of uh, uh, NATO and the U.S. aggression, uh, which caused Russia to have to defend itself by, you know, um, uh, invading Ukraine. Now, um, I, I would say that in the Middle East, um, you, they, they really couldn't care very much about Russia's war with Ukraine. Russia's war with Ukraine is, is not really the issue. It's not about Ukraine. When they look at this whole issue, it's about the West, right? It's about Western hypocrisy. So for the Middle East, they would ask, a lot of people ask themselves, okay, why is the West so concerned about Russia's invasion of um, uh, Ukraine? The West did nothing. You know, when uh, the Syrian war was going on, we were, then when there were all those refugees in, in, in Syria, the West ignored this whole situation. And now it wants the Middle East to be concerned with Russia's war in Ukraine. So a lot of uh, reaction from the Middle East is about how they have felt abandoned or ignored or about this hypocrisy in Western policy. Um, it, it just ignored, you know, the, the sufferings of the people in, in Syria. And so a lot of the reaction is not really about Ukraine per se, but it's about um, the Western reaction to it. So therefore, you will see a lot of Middle Eastern um, uh, respondents in the surveys who are saying that, you know, they blame the West 
um, because of this, you know, West, it, it's not really that they're concerned about the Ukraine per se. Um, I was at a con, uh, my friends were at a conference in Europe, for example, and um, a lot of the, Euro it was a Europe Middle East conference, and all the Europeans were talking about the war, whereas the people from the Gulf were trying to explain to the Europeans, we don't, you, you don't, you guys don't get it. This, this war is not important to us, you know. Um, what is important to us is that you guys abandoned us, you know. Um, you guys didn't care about Syria. And now you want us to line up ag uh, against Russia, with you against Russia. You want us to sanction Russia. You want us to line up in UN votes against Russia. No, we are not interested in doing that because you were not there for us. Oh, very nicely. But I, I have one question from my colleague, Aisha al -Sari. And uh, she says, uh, thanks, Lee Chen. Nice to see you again. I share her sentiments. Uh, so good to see you again. Uh, she has two questions. Uh, to what extent has or will Russia influence energy transition approaches in the Middle East, especially oil producers? Uh, second question is, to what extent Russia cooperate with the Middle East in the area of clean energy? if you could answer that. Okay, um, great questions, Aisha, and it was great to see you in Doha. Um, so uh, Russia does, I think, influence the transition in the Middle East because you know it's a oil exporter, it's a gas exporter, and when you have a, you know, a lot of these oil and gas around, I guess you kind of lock in a fossil fuel based energy system, right? Um, the more you have fossil fuels floating around, the more you lock in a fossil fuel based energy system and the less quickly you transition to um, low carbon energy. Um, Russia really has very little interest in promoting uh, low carbon energy. Um, most of its key exports um, are fossil fuel based. Um, yes, I would say that Russia could play a role in say, uh, R Russia does have quite a lot of um, hydro-based energy electricity, uh, but it's a very, very small percentage of its energy mix. And certainly it's, it's very difficult to export hydroelectricity to the region. Um, but uh, Russia has ambitions to, um, as a hydro hydrogen exporter, right? Uh, Russia has a lot of gas resources. It can make hydrogen, 